Hello and welcome to the Two Man Power Trip of Wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz. With me today, very special guest, a legendary a former a WB announcer for many, many years. He is the legendary Mr. Tony Chimmel. Tony, welcome to the Two Man Power Trip. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. Glad to be here, John. What's going on in your world? What have you been up to? Uh, well, after WWE, I uh, really didn't have anything going on for a little bit. And then... Uh, got a job at Trader Joe's. So I've been working at Trader Joe's uh, a little bit here and there. So are actually full time. So I love it there. And the place is great. And life is good. Were you, you still in New Jersey or you're, no, you're... No, I was born and raised in Jersey, lived there for 40 years. My wife is from Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. So uh, after about, I don't know, uh, a few years we decided to move since her parents were still up in Wilkesbury. mine were in south jersey we kind of moved in between and we moved to a little town called uh, gilbertsville pennsylvania which is about 40 50 miles north of philly and uh after the kids uh went on their own and got married or moved in with their girlfriends or moved out whatever we decided to move down here to fort myers so that's where we are now and we love it here we've been here for a little more than three Somebody years I yeah, somebody I know was saying that it's not Wilkesbury, it's Wilkes Bar or something like that. I was like, that I never uh, heard that before. Yeah, I don't know. I call it Wilkesbury. Yeah, so do I. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's a good little coal mining region up there in upstate Pennsylvania. Were you surprised when you got released from WWE? Because I know, obviously, I was talking to Mike Kyoto. He was shocked too. You guys were around the same time. Were you surprised by the release? Yeah, I was shocked. I mean, you know, I went through all sorts of different phases of getting let go. I mean, you know, when the pandemic hit, you know, I was willing to go and travel and do shows and do whatever and just continue to do my job. And obviously they didn't, you know, they weren't running shows all over the country because of that. But they started running shows in Orlando, which is, you know, only two or three hours from where I live now and where I lived. Uh, and I offered to go there and they were saying, no, they didn't want me there and things like that. And then finally I got a call saying that I was furloughed and I still offered to go back and work there and do what I was doing and all that. And then finally I got a call from Kevin Dunn saying that, uh, you know, I was being let go. Is he the one that makes those calls? I never heard. It's usually like Johnny H somebody. I have never heard of Kevin Dunn. making Well, those calls. Johnny Ace works more with the talent at this stage. I really was, I mean, Kevin really technically wasn't my boss, but he makes a lot of decisions. And, uh, I guess he was the one that I, I don't know if he made a decision or that new guy con or whatever made the decision because I'm sure they, they had independent contractors working in the production office and doing what I was doing for probably a lot less money than I was. And at 59, 60 years of age back then, you know, they probably said, Oh, we can just let him go. And, you know, I guess it was a, a good timing thing for them and a, and a good reason, you know, what do you think of Kevin just in general? Me? I, I don't think he ever really liked me. I don't really have anything bad about him. I mean, you know, I've gotten two calls from him in my 38 years there, one telling me I was furloughed, the other one telling me I was fired. Uh, I don't hate anybody, uh, but I just, I don't think that he was, I don't know, I don't want to say he wasn't happy with me because of my all my bosses were and all of my uh, people that I worked with were, and I always had good, uh, good reviews and things like that. I just don't think he liked me for whatever reason. I don't know. Who were some of your bosses? Who who were like some of the people you worked with? John Selman was my direct boss. Uh, also, uh, and then up the ladder, I went, I think, to Duncan Leslie. And then Mike Grossman. I mean, I've had a whole bunch of different bosses, but at the time I was firing, I think it went like Sean and then Duncan. And then I don't know if Mike Grossman was still there, but another step or two and it got to Kevin. So, you know. What about? What about Vince? 
Like, what did what did you what what did he think of you? What what was your relationship with Vince McMahon? I always had a good relationship with Vince. Vince was always nice to me. Vince never had a problem with me. Vince would always joke around with me and stuff like that. And you know, Vince gave me a career for thirty eight years. I got no ill will till Vince or for Vince, and he always treated me great and was always nice to me. Even you know stuck by me when I had a, an issue with uh, one of my bosses a long time ago. And uh, he stuck with me and stuck up for me, which I really appreciate it. And still grateful for that to this day. Did you work under him though at all? It's, it's, Vince, he's much no, more removed. No, at that, at that stage, Vince really doesn't, you know, Maybe, the, you know, they might say, hey, we, you know, we have, you know, we can save thousands of dollars here, you know, or millions of dollars here if we cut back here. And he's, he's probably like, okay, then cut back. And then it just trickles on down the line, you know, to to who they let go or what they do or anything like that. You know, I was always, you know, the thing that bothered me the most was I was always willing to go to work and always willing to do whatever they wanted me to do. And I kind of feel like I got a little kick to the curb, you know, where the pandemic gave him an excuse to let me go for lack of a better judgment. I don't know. I don't think I was, I was let go by uh, performance or anything like that. I think I was probably either making too much and they wanted to cut corners when, you know, they always say that they're cutting corners and they're trying to save money, but yet the company always makes more money all the time. So I don't know. Does that bug you at all, though? Because when I was talking to Mike, it, the same thing. It was like, okay, you made billions, literally billions. Of, like they had the best quarter ever, and they're cutting people. Does that bother you? Because it's almost like, wait a second, how could you cut people? You had the best quarter you've ever had in the history of the company. Yeah, you know, I, I went through the bitter stage, and I'm past that right now. And uh, I, but that's what every company does, you know. The I always say the answer to everything is money. And yeah, they might be making billions, but guess what? They want to make more billions. So how can they make more billions? You know? And yeah. the next question is, how do we make more billions? You know? And then the next question is, how do we make more trillions? So they're always, you know, the bottom line to Vince was always, how is that making us money? And that was always the bottom line to everything, you know? And, yep. you know, a lot, a lot of time, you know, unless you're in some union gig, the older guy that's making the more money is going to get cut for the younger guy who, you know, makes less money. And, you know, it happens in every job. So it's not just WWE. It's, you know, pretty much a lot of places where, you know, you might be doing a good job and, and doing what you're supposed to do, but they're going to look for somebody that's cheaper. And that's how they save money. What do you think about Vince retiring, shockingly? What do you think about that? Yeah, some. <laughs> I, I do not see Vince sitting on a beach in Florida and not doing anything. He could be retired. That's fine. You know, I refuse to believe that he's not having any input in anything in that company. And it'd be interesting to see if he's still on the payroll or he got a severance package or what goes on with that when you become owner of the company. Is he now not owner? Does he not now not own any stock? You know, does he have nothing to do with the company? Does he not talk about business to Steph or Shane or Hunter or anybody? I don't, I don't know about that. I, I, that's his world. That's his life, that business. And he created a, a, a great business and he created a great career for me for 38 years. And I just, I don't believe he can be retired or not in the input or back, not backstage or anything like that. There's no way I'm believing that he doesn't have any say or no comments about any of that stuff. Or is it getting paid by the company? I don't know. To me, I was like, I wasn't sure about that stuff, too. So I asked somebody smarter than me that knows a lot about money. And they were saying he's still the owner. He still has 80 percent control of the board and he still owns 51 percent of the company. So it's like, how could he kind of not yeah. be involved? Or how can you not go to him for stuff? That's because not he's the owner. as far as I'm concerned. That's not retired as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, to me, it's like I would have to still go to the guy. He still controls the company. You know, he's still the owner. Right. So it's not wonder, like, you know, it, it's not like, you know, he's some owner of a football franchise who sold the team. You know, right. he didn't He didn't do that. So, you know. 
That's why I say, you know, he might, he's in, he's in the back. He's, you know, probably, he's not making decisions like he used to make. That's for sure. But not having anything to do with it, I don't buy that. And if you're saying he still, you know, owns most of the stock, then how much retired can you be, you know? And some of the things I see on TV are very much in line to what Vince would like. You know what I mean? Like you see some things like that's a Vince thing. That's not a Triple H thing. You know what I mean? As far as some of the booking and some yeah, of the directions. Yeah, I also see some Triple H things too. You can tell, well, you know, he's getting his guys back again. And, uh, you know, I don't really follow it all that much to tell you the truth. But I heard that uh, uh, Road Dog is back. Yep. Who I always liked, and he was always good. You know, you can tell Hunter's bringing his guys back. And, you know, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard they're allowed to say the fans instead of the WWE Universe anymore. I don't know. Vince would always put these weird things. You can't say this and you can't say that, which I never got. But, you know, it's his company. He ran it his way, and he certainly had great success. What are some of the other things you can't say? I know wrestling was banned. Now that's back because Drew McIntyre said he I'm a wrestler in a wrestling. Oh, ring. really? Like that's what it yeah. is. Yeah. 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 You couldn't say. So yeah, you couldn't say the, the talent wasn't the talent. They're WWE superstars, and it's the WWE universe, and they're not house shows. They're live events, and you know they're the 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 res or the agents that were in charge of the shows at house shows <laughs> were. Uh, we're called agents. Now they're called, now they change, change that. They're producers, you know? So. Very weird. I think it was, you weren't allowed yeah, to say they made, they or over. strap. What's that? Oh yeah. You can't. I was always, I would always say, Hey, the wrestlers at the house show today are going to put the strap on the line in front of all the fans. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Wrong, 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 wrong. <laughs> you know? So. Whatever. It's just words. I mean, you know. Yeah, it's very weird. It was like other guys are wrestlers for that company. You're in WB, you're a superstar. Like you know yeah, what I mean? Like you I know, I know. I'm not a baseball player. I'm a, you know, all star or something. I don't know. Yeah. You're a New York Yankee. Like you're not a, just a player. Like, yeah, it's uh, interesting. Don't call me a New York Yankee. I don't want to be that. <laughs> oh, you're a boy, Red Sox fan? No, Mets. Oh, Mets. Oh, okay. All right. Hey, they look pretty good. Yeah, they do. Uh, you know, I, I love this new owner guy. He's phenomenal, you know, and uh, he's doing all the right things. And I love the way they're running the organization and stuff like that. We'll just have to see. They just took two out of three from the Dodgers, which I was pretty impressed with. And uh, they got great pitching. I hope DeGrom stays healthy. And, you know, if their hitting comes through, it's that's what it's all about, pitching, defense. And then if you get that timely hitting, you know, you can go a long way. Oh, yeah. The funny thing is, is like, when the Wilpons owned it, it was like, is this a Dodgers franchise? They're obsessed with Jackie Robinson and the Dodgers. Cohen is, you know, Mets old-timers day. Will right. yeah. is getting his number retired. Keith Hernandez, get, I mean, this guy is great for the team. Right. Yeah, I know, and he, that's what I love. He gets the statue of Seaver out there, and they re retire Hernandez's number, and they bring back the old timers. He's, you know, he, he loves the Mets history, and he's a Met fan, and he, you know, and he still he loves to spend money too, which is okay by me. Yes, yes, you that's know? the key thing. I, we'll but, he does it, but he does it wisely too. You know, he does it wisely, and they go out and they get players, and you know, they get the right type of player. You know. Definitely, for sure. But just rewinding back for you, how did you actually get into WWF like to begin with? Was that through Joey Morella or Gorilla Monsoon? Yeah, yeah. I grew up in South Jersey in a town called Willingboro, New Jersey. And oh, yeah. Very familiar. Right, right down the street. You know, we lived in a nice little neighborhood. I loved where I grew up. But uh, maybe when I was about seven years old or something, you know, we're playing street hockey out in the, in the street there in front of our houses and up comes a new kid that just moved into the neighborhood and said, Hey, I'm Joey, you know, can I play? And we're like, yeah, yeah. And just over time you grew a relationship with them and then you find out his dad's a wrestler and we were kids. So we all watched wrestling on Saturday morning. Sometimes, you know, we knew about it and we knew who he was and, and all that. And, uh, you know, I just became good friends with them and, you know, we hung out. He was a couple years younger than me. 
but you know, we went to the same high school together and we, we, he play, you know, we all played the same sports, you know, football, basketball, baseball, street hockey, whatever. And, you know, he was just part of the neighborhood and you got to be close to him and stuff like that. And Gorilla, you know, and Gorilla owned part of, this is before Vince owned the company. Vin, when Vince Sr. owned it, I think he owned part of it. And Gorilla owned part of it. And Arnold Skoland owned part of it. And there was a guy out in Harrisburg named Phil Zatko, I believe, that owned part of it. And Gorilla had a ring. And we would either, you know, during the summertime or, uh, you know, on vacations or something like that, have, uh, you know, we'd go and drive the ring truck to a, a place in uh, like Baltimore or Scranton, PA or Harrisburg or something like that. And you would just do it occasionally, you know, and then we'd sell programs and make, you know, like, I don't know, 10 cents off a program or something like that, that you sold. And uh, then when Vince's dad died, I guess Vince bought Gorilla out and all of that and bought the other guys out. Uh, and maybe a couple weeks after that, Vince called Gorilla and said, hey, did your son want to work for me and set the ring up and he can bring a friend and and Joey brought me and that's how I got in the door in November of 1983 and uh, we just started driving around and setting rings up you know and then the building the business just started to expand as you know Vince made it and you know it just got bigger and bigger and bigger all the time well just by happenstance I mean that's kind of crazy oh, you know yeah. what I mean yeah, yeah crazy I you know, I said I'm very, I was very lucky to get the job, but I think that I was also very good to keep the job for 38 years. So when do you go from like ring crew to announcing? I guess it was somewhere around 89, right? Like, does that just happen because you guys run in so many shows? They need A announcers, B announcers, et cetera. Well, I, I think it was a slow process. I mean, when I first started, we'd set the ring up and then just go hang out in the parking lot or the ring truck or something like that until the show is over and tear the ring down. But over time, as things got more involved, you would take jackets, you would, uh, you know, ring the bell, you would uh, play the music also. Uh, and each one of those jobs paid you like 50 bucks extra. So, you know, <laughs> we would do anything. But the first time I ever announced was one time, uh, I think we were doing a show in like East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania or something at, at some high school. And the ring announcer didn't show up. And Joey said to me, he's like, you know, do you want a ring announce? Ar Arnie Arnold Skolan wants to know if, uh, you know, you want a ring announce because the guy didn't show up. And I'm like, I don't know how to ring announce. I, I never did it before. You know, I'm dressed here in like sweatpants and a T-shirt, you know. Yeah. And, he's like, and he's like, well, he, he says he'll pay you like a hundred bucks. And I said, okay, well, I'll do it. So I just sat at ringside and announced, you know, the wrestlers that were coming out. You know, I wasn't even in the ring. I just sat by the table there. I think one of Tony Atlas was at that show. So I probably announced him and maybe like Mike Sharp and some of those other guys. But uh, that was the first time. And then after a while, just by sitting at ringside, I, I got to learn a lot from like Mel Phillips, who was there at that time, and Howard. You know, you'd see them guys doing stuff. And, you know, I, I, I forget who it was, but they were just like, you know, get a suit. You can ring announce, you know. And uh, I slowly started doing that. And then they were like, well, he's, he's pretty good. And he's got to be there to set up the ring so we can – you know, kill two birds with one stone. We got an announcer that's going to be there because the ring's going to be there. So, you know, that's how I got my foot in the door with that. Pretty good, though, right? I mean, again, a, a little well, bit of luck involved, but this. yeah. I'm lucky to get the job, good to keep the job. Yes, yes. You know? and, and one of the big things that happened was I was doing, I was announcing overseas one time, and I think Bruce Pritchard was there, and he heard me ring announce, and I think he was impressed. And I think that got back to Vince at some point in time. And then they were starting to ask me to do TVs and stuff like that. So I think I started doing like wrestling challenge or something like that. You know? So it's like a gradual process of like yeah. little yeah. by little that you're getting recognized and, and moving yeah, up the it's ladder. It's almost kind of like going up the ladder and, you know, double A to triple A to the major leagues, you know. <laughs> 
and and eventually, obviously, you know, become the SmackDown announcer. This is, I mean, many years later, but yeah. So how does that come about? They just need a separate announcer for the show. They trust you. They like well, I think you. I was doing Raw, and when when Raw uh, when uh, they then they started to get SmackDown. Uh, Kevin Dunn came to me and and said, you know, Tony, we're going to take you off Raw. We want you to do SmackDown, and he's like, don't take it as a slight, you know. SmackDown is, is going to be still a big show and and all of that, you know, don't be disappointed. And then, you know, my personal opinion, SmackDown was doing better than Raw because SmackDown had The Rock and all that, and, you know. But Raw was always their baby. Always. Yeah, definitely. You know, but, you know, and I taught a lot of the people that, you know, that was a tricky thing too. It's like, you know, hey – Lillian's going to sit out here with you and you're going to have to teach her and Justin's going to have to sit out here and teach him. <laughs> and, uh, sorry. Somebody was knocking at my door. Yeah, yeah I heard that. Yeah, That's the dogs go nuts. Yeah. No, uh, he'll be fine though. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm teaching them and I'm like, you know, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm teaching people that are probably going to take my job one day. Right. You know? So but to be a team player, those are some of the things you got to do. And, and like my boss, Sean, always told me, just reinvent yourself and, and make yourself useful and make yourself valuable to the company. And that's when, you know, I was always doing other things like setting the ring up and, you know, playing the music. We used to run cameras. We used to do music. We used to timekeep. We used to, I, you know, take pictures. We, we did all that stuff, you know, drive the truck and. You know, and that's why I started working in the production office as well. So when you, when you are like, you know, teaching the next thing, did Howard Finkel kind of do that for you? Like, was he helping you along? Uh, yeah, a little bit of TVs because at house shows, I just kind of learned and, and just went and kind of did things on my own. And, you know, you learn from everybody, you know, like, and you just try to get your own style and your own, your own thing going. But Howard helped me at TVs. Yeah. It was almost like you became the new Howard. You know what I mean? Like you became the voice of the WWF for a little bit. Yeah. Well, that's nice of you to say. I don't know. I always, I don't want to brag. I always consider myself the best, but that's just my opinion, you know. Oh, Howard, absolutely the best. I mean, just his voice, just, you know, it resonates with and new WWF. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's just like very good, too. Yep. Like burn it in your memory with with Howard and you guys had a match, right? Didn't you guys have a match yeah. where you were like going to take over the duties, which was obviously well, more comedy. I was doing either Raw or SmackDown, and he came out. He was with Jericho or something, and and he came out and uh, came out to me, pushed me or something like that, and then we had some match or whatever, and I beat him. <laughs> that was, I think they like to do that stuff to Howard, you know, so. It is little, what it is. Little pranking and stuff on them? Yeah, you know. Yeah, stuff like that. Prank them and, and, you know, make them lose a match on TV, you know. I think that's for, you know, some of the higher-ups own happiness or, you know, whatever, as opposed to whatever else they're putting on TV. So just to give themselves a laugh almost? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean – Everyone loved Howard. We all loved Howard. And, you know, I think he loved doing whatever he was doing and he would do anything for that company as pretty much I did too. And you just went out there and you did what they wanted. And if they wanted a, two announcers to fight, that's what we did, you know? Yeah, just, I don't know, not out of place, but it's one of those things where it's like, that's not normal. Like announcer versus announcer or who's going to announce <laughs> SmackDown, you know? Yeah, weird. I know. I, you know, I don't make those decisions, so. That's up to the higher ups. I just did what I was told. So, how did you like develop your style? Because you know, like Gary Michael Petta is obviously different than Howard Finkel. You know, who's different than let's like Justin Robbie? I mean, everybody's different. But how do you like develop your own style of of being the announcer? Um, just over time, the more comfortable you get doing it, you know, the more things you try and the more things you want to you just want to do and you know i would just try and emphasize different parts of people's names and stuff like that and you know if you're announcing john cena you might make the john sound bigger than cena or something like that or you know the undertaker you know you make that sound a little bit 
different or a little bit better than others. And, you know, you just, you just try and make your own little style. I mean, not everyone's going to be the same, you know, but you just try to do your own little thing and, and make it that way. With you, I, I mean, there's so many guys that, that you kind of stand out. Like Howard, obviously, was more like Hulk, Hogan. Like, you know, like that stands up, but you're like, oh, yeah. Man, yes. <laughs> Even subconsciously, I'll like yeah. imitate Howard. Oh, yeah. We were backstage, too. <laughs> we always said that he should be on like a GPS or something and turn right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's like that little guy, but he had such a boastful voice that, yeah, yeah. he's just stuck in your head. Yeah. But you're like John Cena, like that is awesome. Like th that just literally came up off the fly because everybody now everyone says yeah. that for Cena. Yeah, I know. No, it's. <laughs> I guess that's a form of flattery. Yeah, definitely. Where's that come from? Like, did you just think of that off the fly, or yeah, something? You know, I. You know, you you just don't want to say John Cena. You want to try and put him over big, so you know the fans you know, really get a bigger pop for him and stuff like that. And that's all I was trying to do was just, you know, I guess be loud and proud. Did he like it? Oh yeah. He liked my announcing. Sure. Cause it seemed like it, it gave it like an extra oomph, like John Cena, you know what I mean? Like that doesn't sound good, but like if he's coming out and it goes, John Cena, I mean, it just sounds like this guy, Oh, like you it elevates it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I would like to try and hold it. You know, he would have a special way of coming into the ring and he'd be at the top of the ramp or something. And I would try to hold the John for as long as he slid into the ring. And then I would say Cena, you know. Right. So sometimes at house shows, he would be like out there on the ramp for like a little bit longer than usual because he knew I was trying to hold it as long <laughs> as I could. So. <laughs> Did Vince and Kevin Dunn, did they like, like love that? Did they say anything to you? Like, oh, great job. That really adds to it. I mean, as long as you weren't, you know, I, I think I always tried to put the talent over, not myself. And that's what I think, you know, they wouldn't like, you know, is if, is if you're trying to, if you're doing it to put yourself over, it's different than if you're trying to put the talent over. And I always tried to put the talent over because let's face it, they're not paying their money to see me. They're paying their money to see the John Cena's and the Rocks and the Takers and all those guys. So I always wanted to try to put the talent over. And Vince or Kevin really didn't give, you know, I mean, unless you really did something really stupid, they were thinking and doing the other things while I was announcing. To me, though, that adds to it. Like, even like you said with The oh, Undertaker, yeah. the way you said The Undertaker, it just, I don't know, it made it more impactful. I mean, it just, it was yeah. just great the way you said it. Right. Now, if I just went out and said The Undertaker, Vince would probably be like, you know, he'd be a little bit more enthusiastic about it, you know, or <laughs> does he not even give a shit if The Taker's coming out, you know? Yep. So. I think the one you're most associated with is Edge. The rated R superstar Edge, yeah. right? I mean, and obviously Beth Phoenix brought you out for the, the Hall of Fame stuff. Yeah, that was nice of her. That was a highlight, one of the highlights of my career doing that. And that was pretty nice of her to do that. Does that show you that Edge obviously loves the way you do it and announce it? It makes him seem more important. Sure. Yeah, Edge loved that announcement. And I love doing it. You know, and it, like you said, it became a thing and it was really nice and it was fun to do it and you know who knows if i'll ever do it again but i hear other people doing it you know but to me it's not the same no when you get uh, like a switch in the announcer even in like your head subconsciously you're like eh, i'd rather chim will do it you know what i mean like don't yeah, really or, or find your own thing you know yep <laughs> that's my thing find your own thing where did you get the just just thought to yourself, like, I'm going to make this, you know, superstar sound, you know, a little bit go up and down. No. Um, I used to travel with Jimmy Corderas, the referee, a lot. Oh, yeah. And uh, when we would travel in the car, you know, we'd always talk about the business and, you know, the world and how to make things better in the business, how to make things better in the world or whatever. And, you know, we were, when somebody would do something stupid, we would you know, say something like uh, Wile E. Coyote, super genius, you know? And uh, that led to when Super Crazy came to WWE, I was announcing him as Super Crazy. And he wasn't there that long, but then when Edge became the rated R superstar, I figured I'd throw it in there. And yeah. that 
took off and you know that one uh he really liked and he would edge really loved when i did that and i enjoyed doing it with you know so many obviously uh, legendary guys who's your favorite guy that like you've ever announced like as far as like doing it seeing it undertaker edge like you're somebody else no, all, all those, the top guys were all great, and they were all great to announce, you know. I mean, Cena was always good, you know, and we'd have fun, and uh, The Rock was always great to announce, and Austin, and, you know, all the girls and the divas and, and all of those people, you know. They're, it was just fun to announce everybody, you know, and you could put a little spin or, you know, just emphasize different parts of pretty much everybody's name. You know, and and it was just a fun experience and a, and a fun career. As we wind it down here, we head towards the finish. What do you think is like the legacy of, of Tony Chimmel? Like if somebody would say like Tony Chimmel and people think of obviously great announcer, but like what do you think when people say your name? Um, I want them to think that, you know, I had a small part in helping build that company from the beginning. I started in November of 83 when Vince pretty much took over and I lasted until November of I think 2019 or 2020. Anyway, I, I had like 38 years in the company and I, I want people to think just, I wasn't just the announcer guy, you know, I did a lot of other things and uh, made a lot of sacrifices for my family and stuff like that. Being on the road, so upwards of 24 days a month when your wife is at home with three kids and you know and you're not always there to parent and you're not always there to do things uh it's a lot of sacrifices you know it's not just you know two hours on tv once or twice a week i mean you know we'd be going overseas for 14 17 days in a row We'd be doing these tours in Japan and then coming back and doing TVs when you're on the road for, you know, seven, 10 days at a time. And then you're home for two or three days. And, you know, the next thing you know, you're packing because you got to go for another three or four days. And sometimes you're married to the business and not married to your family, which is a tough call to make. And what do you do? I mean, you know, the business provided my family with a lot of good things, but, you know, the business also took a, took me away from my family for a lot of good things too, you know, but just people remember that I, you know, I just wasn't a ring announcer. I did a lot of other things too. And sometimes I'd be walking in that building at, you know, six or seven o'clock in the morning and not leaving it until midnight. So I'm just not an announcer. I did, I did a lot of other things too. And I, I want to feel like people like me and, Kyoto and Mark Yaton and Joey Morella and all, a lot of these people backstage helped build the company. Corderas, did I say Corderas? I know he yep. watched a lot of this stuff, but you know, we all helped build this company, you know, and Vince was a great leader and a great owner. And, you know, I, we all grew with the company, you know, it went from driving a little box truck with the ring in it, you know, to, you know, millions of dollars of TV equipment. So, you know, we grew with the company and helped build the company. What's next for you? Anything else like wrestling related or no? Well, I don't know. I'm always willing to listen. If, if people want to uh, ask me, you know, I'd be willing to, to do anything, you know. Uh, but I'm happy at Trader Joe's and working there and, surviving okay and home every day and uh i probably see my wife the last three or four years more than i did the last you know 38 years so, right yeah. i mean it's you know and she hasn't killed me yet so <laughs> i've <laughs> i'm surviving that you know so uh yeah it's all good i mean I, i'm willing to listen to anybody or whatever but uh right now i'm very happy at trader joe's and that's what i'm doing where can everybody find you, like social media and all the other stuff? Uh, I know you got cameos. Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm I also on Cameo, which I like to call Chimio. But uh, <laughs> I just all that information is on my Twitter profile. Uh, 
I do that. Uh, the cameos I love doing. I mean, I've, I've done all sorts of ones. I'd like to do more if people ask. I just uh, congratulated somebody on their first wedding anniversary and stuff like that. I welcomed a newborn kid into the world, you know, the usual happy birthday stuff. And people are very nice on there and they ask me to do things and I'm, I'll do them, you know. So hook me up on Cameo or look me up on Twitter. Awesome. All right, Tony, thank you so much for all the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Anytime.